Hello everyone. Good evening. Welcome to today's session. Uh, we are continuing with the UPSC CSC series on ancient India. I hope I am audible and all. I, uh, there has been some technical issues with internet and all. So in case, you know, uh, if at some point of time the internet crashes or something, please, I um, mean, uh, be patient. I will fix it and be back soon. Okay. I mean, not the internet, my ISP connection. So today we are actually continuing with the ancient India series. We have completed up to the period of Mauryas and we are looking into the post Mauryan period. All right. So before beginning this session, let me warn you, this is, a, this is going to be a long session. All right. Uh, there are, I, I have prepared notes for about four chapters. Usually I finish by two or maximum three. Uh, these are small, small chapters. So I have clubbed it all together and there are four chapters uh, in today's session. I hope to complete the whole thing. Uh, maybe some a bit of extra time will be taken. Uh, but in any case, you know, I do not want to extend this too much. And uh, by July 15th, okay, by the ides of this month, 15th of July, uh, I expect to complete the whole thing, the entire course. Uh, the uh, I mean, within two three classes, the ancient India will be over, and then art and culture has to also uh, has also to be taken. So by 15th of July, I would like to wrap the whole thing up. Okay, then two sessions, uh, individual sessions are there, one regarding uh, main sansa writing and one, reg one regarding the, you know, practice of dowry and history of dowry and all that. That will be definitely taken, but the series thing, the entire, uh, you know, history series uh, will be rounded out by 15th of July. All right. So, uh, in order to achieve that, you know, uh, there will be classes from, you know, today onwards, everyday classes will be there, same time, 5 p.m. If anybody uh, is not able to, you know, keep up. Uh, you can always watch the class in your own time and always, you know, ask your questions and doubts uh, personally to me. My contact numbers and all are given in the uh, Telegram channel. And, you know, you can WhatsApp me your doubts and I will get back to you. Uh, so today onwards, till we complete this course, there will be daily classes at 5 p.m. on history. Okay. Ancient India classes will be over by like two, three more classes and then uh, art and culture, the 11th standard textbook. Okay, so let's begin today's session, lecture eight. Uh, welcome to Madhav Shankara classes. I am Madhav Shankara Advarya. If you have not already subscribed to this channel, please do so and share with your friends as well. Good evening, Satya. So the first chapter that we are going to see today is Central Asian Contact and Mutual Impact. All right, so uh, we will start with the political aspects. Uh, so in the previous class, we have completed up to the decline of Mauryas. Okay, we looked into the causes of the decline of Mauryas. Around 200 BC, you know, Mauryans were finished and uh, we are talking about a period around that, okay, the post-Maurian period. We do not come across any major empires in India at this point of time, but there has been widespread contact between Central Asia and India. Alright, one of the prime causes of Mauryan decline was the lack of attention paid to the Northwestern region. We already established that yesterday. While the Chinese king constructed the Great Wall of China, Ashoka did not pay much attention to the Scythian threat that has been wandering in the northwest of India. But anyhow, there has been very good contact between Central Asia and India around this time. And Mauryans were followed by Shungas, Kannwas, Shatavahanas, Kushans, etc. etc. in India. But the first major power to cross the Hindu Kush mountains were actually the Greeks. Alright, the Greeks, after Alexander's invasion, when Alexander went back, some of them stayed behind. I already told you that. And uh, they were ruling this region called as Bactria. Okay, the north northern Afghanistan area uh, towards the, you know, uh, border of the Mauryan Empire. Okay, that is the part Bactrian region. And they, uh, these Indo-Greeks were ruling this particular region. All right. But, <coughs> sorry. Uh, and these were actually the first powers that actually invaded India. Clear? So the, what is the important cause of this invasion? Plenty of causes are there. Uh, one of the most important one being the decline of strong Mauryas. But among other causes, the most important cause of invasion was the weakness of Seleucid Empire. Okay, Seleucid Empire was actually established in Bactria along with the big region known as Parthia. Okay, area, Iran, area around Iran is known as the Parthia region. So the Seleucid Empire was ruling the whole region. 
and this empire start also just like the Mauryans started to become weak and you know weaker and weaker. This gave rise to a particular dynamics in Central Asian politics, which led to the Indo-Greeks coming into India. Okay, so the Scythians, the tribes. Okay, the Scythians are a particular tribe that was dominating in Central Asia, and these tribes were growing more and more powerful as Seleucid Empire began to become more and more weak. And due to the pressure from the Scythian tribes, uh, many of the kingdoms that ruled in the northwestern part of Indian subcontinent were pushed into the Indian subcontinent. Clear? Also to China. But since the Chinese king, Chinese emperor, built the Chinese wall, the Great Wall of China, most of these people, that uh, the Bactrian Greeks and you know Indo-Greeks and all these people, they were actually pushed more and more into Indian subcontinent. Because Mauryans did not create any kind of defense structure in the northwest. Clear? But even then, the Greeks failed to establish a united rule in India. So the kingdoms of Greeks who were ruling in the northwestern part of Indian subcontinent finally were pushed into the Indian subcontinent, but they did not manage to create a united rule all over India. Okay? And some of the most important uh, Indo-Greek kings are, for example, we have Menander. I think all of you have heard about this particular king, Menander. He is known through this very famous uh, book known as Melinda Pano, that is written by, you know, uh, that is that defines the conversation between Melinda or Menander and Nagarjuna, okay, or Nagasena. I mean, both are the same people. Uh, this conversation between Melinda and Nagarjuna is actually uh, the content of Melinda Pano. And this book is very important source for us as far as India history is concerned because it actually throws a lot of light into the intellectual uh, you know, arena that existed at that time. Anyway, Indo-Greeks were actually the first rulers in India to issue coins that can be attributed to a particular king. That is also very important. Until now, we have seen lots and lots of Panchma coins and all. But these Panchma coins can be attributed to a particular dynasty, not a particular king. Okay, but as far as the coins of Indo-Greeks are concerned, we can actually attribute them to a particular king within a dynasty. So they were the first to do that. Very important for your prelims. They were also the first to issue gold coins in India. Another important question for prelims. Indo-Greeks were the first to issue gold coins in India. They are also associated with a new form of art that grew in the northwestern part of India, which have a lot of Hellenistic features. This eventually came to be known as the Gandhara art, about which we will be talking more in the art and culture session. Then comes the Shakas. After the fall of Indo-Greeks, okay, uh, after the decline of these Indo-Greeks who came to India, its place was actually taken by another very prominent dynasty known as Shakas. They are actually a part of Scythians only. Okay. And it is during these times that the title of Vikramaditya came to the fore. All right. Vikramaditya, who was a king at that time, he is actually one of those Indian kings who finally had a successful uh, you know, campaign against these Shakas. Shakas came to India. None of the Indian kings were able to do anything about it. Most of them failed to, you know, uh, to achieve any kind of success against Shakas. But Vikramaditya was one ruler who succeeded against the Shakas. And in order to commemorate his victory over Shakas, he started something known as Vikrama Samvat in the year 57 BC. Very important. Shaka era, Vikrama Samvat, all these are very important. And Vikrama Samvat starts in 57 BC. And from this point onwards, we will see that many of the prominent kings in India tend to take this title, Vikramaditya. Chandragupta II, for example, in the Gupta dynasty, he takes the title Chandragupta Vikramaditya. So Vikramaditya is not exactly a name of a particular ruler. The Vikramaditya title has been taken by the rulers henceforth. Okay, this is the first time that has been done. Anyway, most famous among the Shaka ruler was actually Rudra Daman I. Another very popular name, Rudra Daman I. He is credited to have undertook repairs in the Sudarshana Lake. Sudarshana Lake is actually located in the Kathiawar zone, okay, Gujarat, Kathiawar zone, semi-arid region. And for the irrigation purpose, it has been used for a very long time. And this lake is said to have been built by Mauryas. And uh, due to the, you know, uh, after a long time, it obviously needed some maintenance and renovation. 
and Rudradam and Quant is credited to have achieved this. And he is actually considered as the most famous among all the Shaka kings. He was also a very great lover of Sanskrit and he issued the first ever long inscription in Shay's Sanskrit. Okay, all the previous inscriptions, all the previous long inscriptions that has been there in India were actually composed in Prakrit, which was the state language for Mauryas. Rudradaman and henceforth, that is the first time when we see the first ever long inscription in Chase Sanskrit. The credit goes to Rudradaman. All right, up till then it is all Prakrit. So this, uh, we do not have much, uh, you know, to study about uh, you know, this particular dynasty and all these things. There are, because these were, you know, smaller, smaller dynasties, nothing like the Mauryas. Uh, we do not have any major empires as such. So after the Indo-Greeks, Shakas came. After a particular point of time, they also declined. And their place was taken by another small dynasty named as Parthians. All right. Parthians actually followed the Shakas. And in many ancient Sanskrit textbooks, uh, the two people are mentioned together as Shaga Pahlavas. Shaga Pahlavas is a, you know, mentioned together in most of these books. Basically, uh, they are together taken as Shakas and Parthians. So Pahlavas means Parthians only. Okay, uh, don't get confused. Originally, these Pahlavas lived in Iran region, Central Asian region. And then due to the pressure from the Scythians, they moved into India, Indian subcontinent. And most famous among them, is actually Gondofernas. And the only important thing that we have to remember regarding Gondofernas is that it is during his time Saint Thomas came to India to propagate Christianity. Okay, very famous personality, Saint Thomas. He came to India to propagate Christianity during the time of Gondofernas, who was the Parthian king. So remember the dynasty of the king. Remember, uh, you know, uh, say Gondofernas is a Parthian king. Similarly, which king relates to what dynasty, that is very important. Don't get confused. Melinda or Menander is actually an Indo-Greek king. Okay. After these three came the Kushans. Kushans are important for us. Okay, because of one important king named as Kanishka. So, Parthians were actually followed by Kushans. And they were known by some other names also. For example, Yuchis or Tocharians. All these are same. All these are Kushanas only. Okay, but and they are also considered same as that of Scythians. Okay, Kushanas actually were one of the five clans into which this Yuchi tribe divided. So these major Central Asian tribe, the Scythians, okay, uh, similar to the considered same as the Yuchi tribe. This was actually divided into five clans, and one of them is considered to be the Kushanas, and they had a large empire all the way from the Oxus River in Central Asia up to the banks of Ganges, okay, that is all the way from Khorasan in the Central Asian region, all the way to the Pataliputra in Bihar. So the entire North Indian subcontinent and the Central Asian area from Oxus River. Everything was under the one single power of Kushana. So after Mauryans, I think probably this is the next important kingdom that came into India that has such a large geographical extent. All right. And because they assumed such a large empire, they came to be known as Central Asian Empire. Kushana Empire is also sometimes called as the Central Asian Empire. Okay. And during this time, due to the nature of such a large empire, the people, I don't know, different peoples and different cultures within the empire began to intermingle a lot. And this led to the rise of new and new kind of composite culture. Okay. Within the Kushanas, there are actually two successive dynasties. The first one was founded by the house of chiefs known as Cataphysis. So Cataphysis is the first dynasty. And in that dynasty, there were two kings, Cataphysis I and Cataphysis II. Cataphysis I is said to have issued coins south of the Hindu Kush. Minting copper coins in imitation to Roman coins is also one of their main features. Okay, Cataphysis I is credited to have issued coins south of the Hindu Kush mountains. Also, he is credited to have, you know, minting copper coins similar to or imitating the Roman coins that existed at that time. Second important king uh, is the, is Cataphysis II. Okay, and by Cataphysis II, the Cataphysis house comes to an end. And within this Kushana dynasty, the second major sub-dynasty is that of Kanishka. 
who succeeds Cadaphasis II. All right, and it is the, actually this Kanishka's dynasty that Kushana power extends all over Upper India and Lower Indus Basin. It is by the time of Kanishka dynasty that the Kushanas actually achieved such a large empire. Up till now, they were, you know, uh, looking into the northeastern region and all, but they never entered into the Indus Basin. They couldn't do so. Hedaphasis II also failed to do that. But when Kanishka came to power, uh, the second sub-dynasty within these Kushanas, they managed to add a lot more territory into the uh, Kushana dynasty all the way up to the uh, river uh, Ganges, including Upper India, the entire Upper India and also the Lower Indus Basin. Okay, and it is actually the Kushanas who issued a lot of gold coins with higher degree of metallic purity than what we find in Gupta times. I have not taken Gupta period yet. That will be taken in the next class. But Kushana dynasty issued the highest pure purity of gold coins in India. Important for prelims. Okay, we find the most number of gold coins has been issued by Guptas. I will write it down here. Most number of gold coins has been issued by the Guptas but highest purity gold coins has been issued by the Kushanas. Don't forget. All right. So Kushanas, you know, uh, uh, they came up with large, you know, uh, quantities of very high pure purity gold coins and within India, within the Indian subcontinent, Kushanas had two capitals. All right. One is Purushapura, that is the Peshwa, modern day Peshwa. And the second one is Mathura in Uttar Pradesh, not Madurai in Tamil Nadu. No, it is Mathura in Uttar Pradesh. So Mathura in UP and Pushpapura or Peshawar in modern day Pakistan, these two were the capitals of Kushana Empire within the Indian subcontinent. And in Peshawar, Kanishka erected a monastery as well as a huge stupa. So Kanishka becomes you know, a huge pattern of Buddhism that we will talk about in the upcoming slides. And he erected a very famous monastery as well as a huge stupa in Peshawar. Kanishka was the most famous and most important of all the Kushana rulers. And he is the one who started the Shaka era in AD 78. Very important again. So we've studied about three eras. Okay. Shaka era. I mean two eras so far. One more will be we will be studying when we take up Guptas. We studied about Shaka era. We studied about Vikram Sambhat. And we will st also st speak about the Gupta era when we we'll come to it. All these are important. Please remember the exact year. Okay. Shaka era starts in AD 78. Earlier we saw that another uh, another one, Vikram Sambhat starts in 57 BC. Don't get confused. Not AD, that is BC. This one is AD. Alright. Kanishka is also very important in history because he is the one who organized the very famous Buddhist council in Kashmir. There were four Buddhist sang, uh, you know, Sanghidis and among them, the last one, the fourth one has been uh, you know, organized by Kanishka in Kashmir. And this is where the doctrines of Mahayana form of Buddhism were finalized. We see a split in Buddhism, Mahayana and Hinayana, but the doctrines of Mahayana Buddhism were, were also finally uh, you know, completed in this particular council, organized by Kanishka. Okay, so the Kushana Empire, west of Indus, was supplanted by another small dynasty named as Sassanians. Another small power called the Sassanians basically took control over the Kushana Empire that is west of Indus. So not anymore a concern of us. All right, because it is towards the Iran region. But towards the east of Indus, towards the, within the Indian subcontinent, the Kushanas continued for some more time and they existed say uh, over a century. All right, so by the middle of the third century, the Sassanians has occupied the lower Indus regions as I have mentioned. We do not have much to study about Sassanians, but a Sassanian inscription of AD 262 used this term Hindustan for this region. Okay, they do not use the term Hindustan in order to identify the religion Hindus. No, they use the term only to, uh, you know, 
point towards the people who lived in this region of Indus. Clear the people and the uh, culture that existed in the Indus region, that is what was represented by them as Hindustan or Hindu. They did not mean the Hinduism as the religion that we speak today. Alright, so the term Hindustan that is used for India in the Mughal and modern times was first used in 3rd century AD by Indo-Sassanians. That is why this is important for prelims. Okay, so and they ruled over India for a very short time, less than a century. But they too have left behind a large number of coins. That is important for all these kingdoms. Every kingdom that we have uh, talked about so far left behind lots and lots of coins. Large number of coins are available to us. Okay, so the, all these actually points to the economic uh, you know, upliftment that happened during this period. Economy flourished around this period. Okay, because I mean it is evident from the large number of coins that we see from all these kingdoms. It's not just one kingdom that does it. Almost all of them, the Parthians, the uh, uh, you know, Bactrians, uh, the uh, Kushanas, Indo-Greeks, everybody left behind, Indo-Sassanians, all of them left behind large number of coins. And coins always mark uh, trade as well as economy. Okay, now, so now let's see what is the impact of Central Asian contacts and you know uh, through various angles, starting with structures and pottery. So because of the arrival of all these Central Asian or say uh, Northwest Indian kingdoms into the Indian subcontinent, there has been an intermingling of different cultures, the native one and the arrived, arrived, arrived one. So because of this intermingling, there occurred lot of lots and lots of changes within the indigenous cultures. So what are these? Let's look at it in different different angles, starting with structures and pottery. So there has been a lot of advance in building activities. Okay, Central Asian methods of building etc. were brought into India and it was uh, also, you know, it also came mingled with the native method of building and architecture and we see a lot of influence. Burned bricks for flooring and tiles both for flooring and for roofing is very common around this period. Okay, burn bricks for flooring has been there even earlier, but tiles both for flooring and roofing is seen abundantly during this period. But that does not mean that it is actually these Indo-Greeks or it is actually the Central Asian uh, kings who bought, who brought these tiles into India. No, it is not something that we adopted uh, from outside that has been there in India earlier itself, but we see an abundance of this during this particular time. Construction of brick walls is another very famous feature that we see in this period. Okay, these are individual points, try to remember. I will upload this slide in the Telegram channel. You can use it for quick revisions. Okay, and the characteristic pottery that they used was redware. Okay, there is a characteristic pottery for each and every face. We studied about it already. In the Iron Age, it is the Northern Black Polished Ware. In the Calcolithic period, it is the Ochre Color Pottery. Okay, so uh, there is the PGW pottery that is uh, in bit come, that comes in between. So for a individual time period, for each time period, there is a characteristic pottery, and the characteristic pottery for them, the uh, the post Mauryan period that we are speaking about, is redware, both plain, uh, both plain as well as polished ones. Okay, and we also come across some distinctive pots such as sprinklers and you know spouted channels, etc., etc. The sprinklers means you know that the water pot where you know the water can sprinkle out okay so similar kinds of pottery are also very common in this period cavalry i think this is a no-brainer okay they are central asians obviously and central asia is a place where we find much 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 high quality horses that than that we see in india that we already spoke about in the medieval indian history uh, Arab, Arabian horses were very important for battles in India and it was used in a considerable fashion. It was imported in very large quantities into India by various kings in medieval Indian period. So obviously the Shakas and Kushans, you know, uh, they also had superior variety of cavalry. But before speaking about cavalry, these Shakas and Kushans, they did not have their own script. Okay, they do not have their own script. They do not have their own written language. They do not have any kind of organized religion. 
So what did they do? Once they came to India, they adopted all these things from Indian society. And once they did that, they became an integral part of Indian society. They are foreigners. Okay, they are foreigners. They came to India and they settled down in India. Just like the Mughals. Mughals were also foreigners, but they came to India, they adopted Indian styles and they settled down. They made India their home. Same thing was done by Shagas, Kushans and all these people. And once they did so, they introduced better cavalry. Okay, and you know, they started the use of these riding horses on a large scale. They popularized the use of reins, saddles and all these things. We find a lot of uh, equestrian terracotta figures from this period. Equestrian means what? Horse. Okay, equestrian means horse. Uh, that's it. So we find lots and lots of terracotta figures of these horses uh, from this period. That also points to the fact that horses became very important in the post mauryan periods in India. Shakas and Kushans introduced turban, tunic, trousers, heavy long coat, etc. Okay, we see uh, these turbans and all where, you know, that the North Indians wear uh, sometimes, right? Similarly, heavy long coat that has been, that usually the North Indian royalty uh, used to wear for it throughout the medieval India. All these were actually brought to India by these Shakas and Kushans and all. They are credited to have brought all these things into Indian subcontinent. Central Asians also brought cap, helmet, boots and all these things. So basically their arrival bettered the cavalry. Okay. Now trade and agriculture. So naturally because of the you know such a large empire that the Kushanas managed to set up not exactly the Mauryan type but at least uh, still they had a vast empire. Uh, India received a great fund of gold from the Altai mountains in Central Asia. Okay, so when they came to India, their native home is Central Asia. So from there, they India also got a large number of, uh, you know, a large fund of gold. Also, India got abundance of gold through its trade with Roman Empire. Roman Empire was also flourishing around this time. And India maintained very cordial trade relationship with Romans, both North Indians as well as South Indians. And the trade was favorable for Indians. So obviously a lot, lot of precious metals came into India, especially gold. So through the Central Asian contacts, as well as through the trade relationship with the Romans, India had an abundance of gold. Now, Kushans controlled the Silk Route. I hope you know what Silk Route is. Silk Route starts from China. Through Central Asia, it goes all the way to Mediterranean Sea. It's a long route starting from China all the way to Mediterranean Sea. So this is a very important historical route as far as trade is concerned. Spice route and silk route. So Kushanas were ruling the Central Asian region, also the northwestern part of India. So they were able to have a lot of control in the silk route. Okay, so having that kind of control enabled them to collect lots and lo lots and lots of taxes and levies, etc, etc, which also made the economy grow further. Kushanas were the first rulers in India to issue gold coins on a wide scale. Very important. I hope you understood the difference. Indo-Greeks were the first to do a lot of things. But here it says that Kushanas were the first rulers in India to issue gold coins on a wide scale. That, there's a very subtle difference there. I hope you understood. Okay, look at the Indo-Greeks portion. In the, at, that, at that time we studied another. Let me just take it. Otherwise you will be confused. I think it's written somewhere. Yeah, Indo-Greeks were the first rulers in India to issue coins that can be attributed to a particular king and they were the first to issue gold coins in India. Okay, that's what it said there. But on a wider scale, it was done by Kushanas. Clear? That is the difference. I hope you are very clear. Now, Kushanas also promoted agriculture. Okay, despite, you know, they already have a flourishing economy with trade and all, but they also have power over fertile regions. So they promoted agriculture. The earliest archaeological traces of large-scale irrigation in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Central Asia, etc., etc., are actually dated to the Kushana period. Now comes polity. So what are the changes that happened in polity? Okay, I will look into your comments in a bit. Okay, after this one, I will check your comments. So this is also the time when, in the northwestern part of our subcontinent, there is a development of feudatory organization. 
okay petty principalities all emerged around this period or and you know uh, these kingdoms you know parthians and you know uh, uh, indo greeks etc etc they were also not exactly larger kingdoms okay and their presence actually converted the whole thing into a kind of a feudatory organization kushanas adopted a pompous title of king of kings okay so kushanas i mean they they are the like they are the emperor kind of people there are many petty principalities ruled by local kings uh, you know within india at the in the northwestern part of india at that time so since kushanas are you know ruling these kings and ruling these principalities they themselves adopted the title of king of kings understood so that is why i said there is a feudatory kind of organization that flourished in this in this region both shakas and kushans strengthened the idea of divine origin of kinship what is the idea of divine origin of kinship kings are representatives of god on earth so that is the divine origin of kinship the theory of divine origin of kinship that has been brought by shakas and kushanas okay earlier in the mauryan period ashoka called himself as devanam pia that is dear to gods i hope you remember ashoka called himself as devanam pia but kushana kings called themselves called themselves themselves as sons of gods okay not dearer to gods but sons of gods there is a clear difference i hope you are taking this in ashoka called himself as devanam pia that is dearer to gods kushanas called themselves as sons of gods that means they are gods themselves okay and they adopted this title from chinese chinese used to call themselves as son of heaven and kushanas modified that and made it son of god clear so that is how the kushanas adopted these titles and if you remember in from the previous class the system of satraps or the satrapi system was very common in central asia satrapi system means what the entire area region or the entire empire is divided into smaller smaller units known as satraps or satrapis each in charge of, of a satrap just like the entire mauryan empire is divided into provinces each in charge of a governor the central asian kingdoms are divided into satrapis each in charge of a satrap so the satrap system was further strengthened by the kushanas and later adopted by shakas also now in earlier adopted by shakas also we also find certain very curious practices in this polity for example the practices of hereditary dual rule this is very interesting thing we never see these kinds of things in you know anywhere else in history some exceptions but other than that not much what is this hereditary rule, dual rule it means two people two kings ruling at the same time okay we even have instances where father and son both together ruled the kingdom the same kingdom ruled by two people at the same time that is known as hereditary dual rule this is also a very typical feature of uh, these kingdoms all these points to the fact that there has been less tendency of centralization clear the monarch itself is two two people okay minimum two people so that itself means there is less and less centralization earlier we spoke about a feudatory kind of organization so all these points to the less tendency of centralization in mauryan period there was a high tendency of centralization okay uh, i mean there were the mauryan pro mauryan territory was divided into different different provinces and these provinces had certain degrees of autonomy but still all of them accepted the suzerainty of the mauryan emperor so the final power was completely concentrated in the hands of one person that is the mauryan monarch here also i mean power is concentrated into the monarch obviously but there are instances where there are two monarchs ruling at the same time through hereditary dual rule so all this points to the less and less tendency towards centralization okay greeks also introduced the practice of military governorship that is also very important and these governors were known as strategos okay i already told you there were petty petty principalities here and there and greeks were basically foreigners who came to india so they wanted to have firm control over the indian territories so rather than giving these territories into the hands of a civilian officer they gave this into the hands of a military officer so military is you know military officer is much more strict and much more you know he has this the entire military under his command right 
so he will be able to establish much more firmer command for this reason these greeks also introduced the practice of military governorship okay let me check if there are any questions good evening satya good evening vasant lakshmi good evening sushma seema shetty good evening I haven't seen you for a long time welcome back uh satya pande yeah i mean divinity rule has been there uh, even before them okay but in india we can say that kushanas also used the uh, theory of div divine origin of kings okay i mean the chinese called themselves as the uh, you know, sons of heaven they already did that so kushanas took it from them and started calling themselves as sons of gods so we can't say that kushanas invented this rule no but they also used it that's it feudal organization was different uh, to that of present in yes european feudalism and indian feudalism are completely different nothing same okay in europe we have in the you know european model of feudalism has certain typical features such as manner uh, um, you know a manner and serfdom and all these kinds of things but in india our feudalism is not exactly the same and here we say that certain feudatory organizations were there and by saying that we mean there were petty petty kings who were more or less like us you know a, a feudal agency okay i mean uh, if there are say if this is the entire kushana region then it, all these were divided into various smaller kingdoms each in charge of a king okay and together the whole thing was in, under the control of the kushana emperor okay so individually each of them can be considered as a feudatory that is what is meant here so nothing like the european feudal system so okay sima all right so continuing uh, new elements in indian society i know that i am going a bit fast so if you are feeling you know that you could not catch up at any point of time you can always put it in the chat and i will slow down but as i said i am trying to cover four chapters today and i do not want to keep you here too long and these are simple simple points uh, at the time you might feel a bit confused but once you read it again it will be nothing okay that is what that is why i am going a bit too fast also as i have mentioned earlier there will be classes every day from today so that i am intending to cover the whole thing the entire history portion by july 15th okay i want to wind this up by july 15th so there will be classes every day at 5 pm from today onwards until we finish okay two chapters one or two other videos one on dowry system and one on main sensor writing that will be taken you no know, differently okay so new elements in indian society so once these people came to india they also brought a lot of new elements into indian society obviously so they came to india they settled down in india and they began to become completely indianized they were not foreign powers who came to india plundered india and went back no they came here and they settled down here and they eventually became indianized all right but most of them came as conquerors that is true right all of them came as conquerors as invaders etc etc because of that fact when they were absorbed into the indian society they were considered as a warrior class they were conquerors so obviously they were considered as the warrior class when they were absorbed into the indian society so in indian society who constitutes the warrior class kshatriyas okay in indian society kshatriyas con you know, constitute the warrior class so kushanas or say these uh, people who came to india in the post mauryan period they also were absorbed into indian society as kshatriyas but manu the lawgiver manu stated that shakas and the parthians were kshatriyas who had deviated from their duties and fallen in status okay the indigenous indian folk were not ready to give the first grade kshatriya status to these people so manu the lawgiver at that time he actually considers the shakas and parthians as second class kshatriyas understood they were not ready to hand over the first degree to these invaders so they were considered as a second class kshatriyas i hope you understood now comes religion most of the rulers uh, and you know others from central asia adopted vaishnavism vaishnavism means what worship of lord vishnu 
Vaishnavism was one of the most popular, uh, you know, kinds of, uh, say, sect at this point of time. The Greek ambassador called Heliodorus, very famous for the pillar at Basinagar. Okay, Besnagar Pillar is associated with Heliodorus, who was the Greek ambassador. And he actually erected this pillar in honor of Vasudeva. So, the Vasudeva cult, okay, the cult of Vasudeva was very much prevalent at this point of time. And this is 2nd century BC. Along with Vaishnavism, the other important religion that was, you know, flourishing is Buddhism. So, few of the rulers also... No, took up on Buddhism. Best example, Kanishka. He was an ardent follower of Buddhism. Okay, and uh, we find a lot about this, you know, uh, the spread of this religion at this point of time from Milinda Pano, which we already talked about. Milinda Pano, the conversation between the Buddhist monk Nagasena and the Greek king Menander or Melinda. This gives a lot of intellectual insight into the history of post Mauryan period, important for prelims. Melinda Pano gives us insight into the post Mauryan period. Okay, very, very important. Kushana rulers worship both Shiva and Buddha. Okay, Kanishka himself, he also was a Shaivite at the same time, Buddhist also. Okay, we find images of both of these, you know, Shiva and Buddha appearing in many Kushana coins. Several Kushana rulers were also worshippers of Vishnu. For example, the uh, follower of, say, the successor of Kanishka, one of the successors of Kanishka is actually by the name Vasudeva. So, Vasudeva is actually a name of Vishnu only, right? So, from that itself, we can understand that some of these rulers were ardent followers of Vaishnavism also. So, Shaivism, Vaishnavism, sorry, Shaivism, Vaishnavism and Buddhism, all these flourished during this period. Okay, so now let's see the origins of Mahayana Buddhism. So, because of this, you know, trade activities and contacts with Central Asian period and because of the vast immigration into India from Central Asia, lots and lots of changes happened within the native religious systems in India. And Buddhism was one of the religions which got affected the most. Okay, so the Indian religions started to undergo lots and lots of changes in the post Mauryan times. Alright, so in the Buddhist monarch, uh, you know, uh, monastic establishments in the monasteries and all, we find lots and lots of coins. Large number of coins are seen in Buddhist monasteries in this region. Okay. Also, these Buddhists started to welcome these foreigners into these monasteries. These foreigners are non-vegetarians and Buddhism is all about no ahimsa and all, but still they were you know, accepted and welcomed into these monasteries. And in general, these you know, Buddhist monks and nuns, they started to have a life of laxity and they started to live a life of luxury, etc, etc. All these are examples that points to this fact. Okay. And some of these people who went into these laxities and all, they even deserted the religious order and went back to their family life, householder life. And this is actually when the new form of Buddhism known as Mahayana Buddhism became very popular. Mahayana means what? Maha means great, Yana means vehicle. So, Mahayana means great vehicle. Clear? And Mahayana Buddhism is one of the liberal forms of Buddhism and here actually image worship was started. Okay, image worship was actually started in Mahayana Buddhism but it occurred or it was continued on a larger scale in Brahmanism. Clear? And now with the Mahayana school established, the old Puritan school, which did not engage into these kinds of luxuries and laxities, they remained as, an, as a different branch known as Hinayana school. Hina means less and Yana means vehicle. So Hinayana means lesser vehicle. So Buddhism divides into two Mahayana and Hinayana during the period of, especially during the period of Kanishka. And Kanishka was a great pattern of Mahayana school of Buddhism. And it is in the fourth Buddhist Sangeeti that is organized by Kanishka in Kashmir that the doctrines of Mahayana Buddhism was consolidated. Alright. And now we talked about religion. The other important aspect is art. Okay. We will talk more about art in the art and culture sections. 
uh, but here we can just you know quickly look into it some important aspects so the uh, foreigners who came to india these foreign princes and kings and all they were very enthusiastic about indian art and architecture they also bought their own styles and all with them okay kushanas bought you know, uh, masons and other artisans all trained from different central asian schools into india so there actually were three different prominent schools central asian ganthara and mathura in the northwestern part of india this particular school known as ganthara school emerged the most important feature of this ganthara school is greco roman style of sculpture okay images of buddha that are made in the ganthara school is actually of greco roman style okay the hair of buddha is you know all tied in a greco roman fashion we will study in depth about greco roman and ganthara architecture in art and culture portions there has been some influence of this ganthara style into the mathura school also but mathura center mathura school was actually primarily a center of indigenous art okay later it gets some influence from ganthara school but primarily mathura school is indigenous okay and in mathura school we see the very famous headless erect of kanishka's statue okay there is a statue and that statue does not have a head okay it is basically from neck down and actually that statue belongs to kanishka so if there is no head how can we identify the person of the statue because that name kanishka is written underneath the statue so that that particular statue belongs to the mathura school of sculpture okay and mathura school also have produced lots and lots of images of varthamana mahavira in the pre gupta sculptures that is i mean the post mauryan period is also you know uh, we sometimes call it as the pre gupta period because the next important dynasty that comes after the mauryan period is actually the guptas okay the major one so in the pre gupta sculpture inscriptions actually ignore krishna this is another very curious factor mathura in uttar pradesh is very famous for krishna right krishna was you know born and brought up etc uh, in mathura and you know and adjacent areas like vrindavan and all so mathura is very important for krishna but in the pre gupta period krishna is almost completely absent in all art and sculpture forms okay that is something very curious it is only during the gupta period that we see krishna being very important in uh, you know sculpture and most of the mathura arts and sculptures were actually constructed using red sandstone all right we will study further details about mathura school also in the art and culture portion but anyway there were some other important schools also for example nagarjuna konda and amaravati these two also were important centers of buddhist architecture and sorry buddhist art and early panels of buddhism can be found at both gaya sanchi bahrut etc etc so plenty of centers in india most prominent ones are the ganthara and mathura schools now regarding literature and learning okay so <laughs> as i have mentioned uh, kushanas and you know uh, these people they did not had their own script or their own language or anything as such uh, no written inscriptions or any such things but they were very conscious of the fact that people used various scripts and languages in their dominions that is true when they came to india they did not had their own indigenous script or anything but they understood that now within their territory within the newly acquired territory there are different kinds of people each one has their own kind of script their own language etc etc so there is that plurality within these newly acquired territories so they these people these you know foreign rulers they were very you know tolerant towards all these and they accepted all these things and they also patronized all these things okay so they issued coins and inscriptions in all these languages so that everyone can understand the royal orders etc etc so greek kharosthi and brahmi were used as scripts and greek prakrit and sanskrit influenced prakrit all these were used as languages okay so three scripts greek kharosthi and brahmi and four languages greek prakrit sanskrit influenced prakrit and later pure sanskrit were used for communicating to the people this is it is this time 
when we find the earliest specimen of kavya style in sanskrit this is actually found in junagadh inscription of rudradaman in kattevar junagadh inscription also speaks about the sudarshana lake being modified being renovated by uh, rudradaman and in this junagadh inscription we find the first or the earliest specimen of kavya style of poetry in sanskrit okay and from then onwards inscriptions began to be composed in pure sanskrit that i already told you earlier okay prakrit also continue but sanskrit became more and more prominent the, it is also this time when we find some of the very prominent writers in history like ashwagosha ashwagosha was actually patronized by kushanas ashwagosha is the person who wrote the very famous biography of buddha named as buddha charita he also composed another very important sanskrit kavya named as saundarananda these are works of ashwagosha who was patronized by kushanas anyway mahayana buddhism led to the composition of numerous you know avadanas avadana means what life history and teachings okay avadivya avadana okay or etc etc uh, you know you have this avadana sub term in all this avadana means life history and teachings so mahayana buddhism basically led to composition of many of these avadanas in buddhist hybrid sanskrit the best examples mahavastu and divyavadan indian theater also owes a lot into greek influence okay indian i mean uh, it's not entirely greek indian has indian theater has a lot of indigenous features also but it also owes certain features to greek influence best examples are the caves of ramgarh hills okay and another important feature that we borrowed from the greeks in the theater area is curtain we have the curtain right in theaters and all in the performance arts we always use a curtain this is nothing not indigenous to india this is actually something that we took from the greeks okay and that is the reason why theater forms came to be called as yavanika okay yavan yavana means what yavana was a term that was used in earlier times to denote greeks eventually the term came to be used for denoting every foreigner but originally it was used to denote greeks so since this curtain etc were borrowed from the greeks the theater art forms came to be known as yavanika all right now india's contribution to the you know development of theater is obviously undeniable the lots of indigenous features are also there best example patanjali patanjali mentions the presentation of such scenes like you know binding of bali or say the killing of kamsa etc etc so plenty of indigenous contributions are also there into the theater forms that arose this time bharatas natya shastra very important work on you know uh, rhetoric and you know uh, dramaturgy okay dance and drama bharatas natya shastra very important even now it's a very prominent textbook as far as dance forms in classical dance forms in india are concerned okay and this actually this textbook actually marks the full fledged theater entry into india then there are some secular other you know some other secular literature works also for example we have the kama sutra kama sutra written by vatsyayana okay that textbook belongs to 3rd century ad and it is one of the earliest works on erotics dealing with you know sex and love making vatsyayana's kama sutra and it also gives a picture of the life of a city bred person or a nagaraga who lived in the period of thriving urbanism that is also the reason why this book is very important because kama sutra actually you know pictureizes a person living a very urban life in a very urban kind of settlement so from this book we can identify a lot about the town also okay the kind of urban settlement that existed at that time also coming to science and technology indian astronomy and astrology profited a lot from the greeks okay astrology uh, not exactly pure science but astronomy you no know, pure science both of them actually benefited from greeks the term horoscope horoscope is actually a greek term and we use it in english also these days horoscope has its origin in hora shastra hora shastra is actually a sanskrit term that denotes astrology okay so that is from where the greeks got the term horoscope similarly greek coins 
they were actually very properly shaped and stamped and all and they were a very great improvement over the earlier punched mark coins those punched mark coins that existed before the arrival of greeks in india they were very you know irregular and all okay but once the greeks came here and they introduced their coins it was properly shaped and stamped and all now it became very much standardized another term just like the hora shastra and horoscope there is another very important term drashma drashma is actually the term which eventually evolved into drama that is also a greek term drashma all right greeks rulers also used brahmi script and represented some of the indian motifs on their coins for example dogs cattle spices ivory so lots and lots of indian motifs were also used in greek coins okay but if they have learned you know any other craft from india is not exactly known to us but we find indian motifs in greek coins indians did not owe anything to uh, striking to the greeks in the field of medicine botany chemistry etc because we had our own physicians and surgeons like charaga shushruda etc who wrote masterpieces like charaga samhita shushruda samhita etc charaga is the great physician who talks about medicine and medicinal plants and all shushruda is the surgeon okay i hope it's you know i remember it easily using the abbreviation ss sushruda surgery that is ss so you will never get confused the other one is charaga charaga is actually medicine so cm chief minister is charaga and ss is sushruda sushruda surgery charaga medicine this is how i remember it you can use your own you know quick fixes in the field of technology uh, you know some other things were also very prominent kanishka is represented wearing trousers and long boots which obviously is something that they bought from central asia introduction of stirrup for better use of the cavalry is another contribution possible practice of making leather shoes began in india during this period another very prominent point for prelims practice of making leather shoes actually began during this period kushana copper coins were actually an imitation of roman coins gold or gold coins that were in india was also more or less an imitation from roman gold coins okay and i already told you that there has been a flourishing trade between romans and indians okay and uh, there has been some good diplomatic relationship also because embassies were actually sent into the court of roman emperor augustus during this period not just augustus but also to trajan augustus and trajan these two emperors also have received embassies from india okay this also points to the fact that there has been very cordial relationship between roman and indians at that point of time all right and it is from them the, from the romans from the greeks that we finally studied and you know mastered uh, the working in glass okay working in glass which was flourishing in this particular period was actually influenced by the foreign ideas and practices in no other time in history india witnesses such progress in glass making okay so that is something of a very important contribution from these parts so that comes to the uh, that by that we come to the end of first chapter and second chapter is the shatavahana phase before that any questions uh let me see one second pinayana madura okay correct Hmm. Okay, no questions. I think okay. If I miss something, uh, please point me out again. But I do not find any questions. So continuing the Shatavahana phase. All right. So this is a bit crammed up slide. I know that. I'm sorry for that. Uh, but you can you know always look into the PDF once I upload it later. Okay, I'm going a bit fast. I know, but as I have said, I'm taking multiple chapters today, so I will go a bit fast. If you are unable to follow at any particular point of time, you can always, you know, uh, message me that. Also, you can ask any doubts later or at any time uh, through my Telegram or through my WhatsApp, and I will definitely get back to you. Okay, so Shatavahana's political history. So we already talked about the northwestern part of India, where all these things were happening. You know, Kushanas, Shakas, you know. Parthians, Bactrians, all these things. Now we are coming to the Deccan and Central Indian region. This is where Shatavahanas succeeded the Mauryas. Shatavahanas did not immediately succeed Mauryans. 
they actually there was actually a period of 100 years between the beginnings of shatavahanas and end of mauryas okay they are actually considered same as antras the who are mentioned in puranas but the interesting thing is that puranas speak about antra rule but they do not speak the term shatavahana and shatavahanas inscriptions they do not use the term antra okay but since they both ruled at the same time in the same geographical locations historians believe that antras and shatavahanas are one and the same okay so they continued these uh, no, shatavahanas basically continued whatever was going on in india you know iron plowshare paddy transplantation urbanism writing these were kind of conditions that happened in the mauryan period it was continued in the post mauryan period also okay and all these led to the development of a strong state under shatavahanas these were uh, no one of some of the reasons that led to the growth of mauryans also same factors led to the growth of shatavahanas as well and the earliest inscriptions of shatavahanas relate to first century bc when they defeated the kanvas in north india an another prominent dynasty that came up was kanvas and when they defeated kanvas uh, shatavahanas made an inscription and that is the earliest shatavahana inscription that we find and that is in the year or in the period of first century bc okay historians believe that the, uh, in the early period, Shatavahanas did not actually rule the Antra region, but they ruled the northern Maharashtra region. But gradually, they extended their empire into all different, uh, you know, directions and finally took over Karnataka, Antra, etc, etc. And on doing so, their major competition was Shakas. Okay, so Shatavahanas and Shakas were contemporaries. Alright, and among the Shatavahanas, the most important king is Gautami Putra Shatagarni. He called himself as the only Brahmana. Okay, they are claiming a Brahmanical lineage. I think someone asked, I think Satya asked this question in the previous class. These rulers started to claim themselves as descendants of great lineages of Brahmana. So, Gautami Putra Shatagarni said, him, said himself that he is the only Brahmana. Okay, and he defeated the Shakas and destroyed many Kshatriya rulers. That is also true. He destroyed the Shakas and many Kshatriya rulers, etc., etc. And he claimed to be the only Brahman. And he claimed to have ended the Kshatriya lineage to which his adversary Nahapana belonged. Nahapana was a Shaka. And uh, Gaudavi Buddha Shadagarni basically defeated him and you know, destroyed the power of Shakas forever. Gaudavi Buddha Shadagarni was immediately succeeded by Vasishti Buddha Pulumai. Okay, very unique names this is very important attribute of shatavahanas we will speak about this in the end of this session okay so gadavi putra shatagarni was uh, followed by vasisti putra pulumai and their capital was paitan or the pradishthan on the banks of river godavari okay and yaknashri shatagarni was another important king and probably the last important king king of shatavahana dynasty yaknashri shatagarni he is important because he is the one who recovered the northern Konkan and Malwa region from Shaka rulers. That is one attribute associated with him. Second one, he was a pattern of trade and navigation. Okay, in his coins, we can see the representation of a ship. Okay, we can see the representation of a ship in the coins issued by Yaknya Sri Shadagarni. And he is called, uh, he is called uh, a very important personality as far as uh, navigation is concerned. And he is the last important king of Shatavahana dynasty. So what, what is the aspects of material culture that uh, we see in Shatavahana period? More or less it is the same as that of Maurya period. Okay, Material culture uh, in central India is something that of an extension of Maurya period. So if you remember the Mauryan period material culture, you would definitely know the answer to this. The only difference is some indigenous features also comes into play. That's all. Okay, so we see a fusion of local elements and northern ingredients together, obviously. Now, some southern influence also, for example, the megalithic builders, megalithic builders of Deccan, they were fairly acquainted with the use of iron and agriculture, etc. We find lots and lots of iron implements such as hoes, sickles, spades, plowshares, axes, so and so. Okay, tanged and socketed arrowheads are also very common during this period. We find evidences of ancient gold workings 
from the Kolar gold fields. All these are logical. Okay, this is nothing that you have to buy hard. Think about the geographical region and write the answer. I already told you the Shadavahanas overpowered Karnataka, Andhra, Maharashtra, etc. So, Kolar gold fields is in Karnataka. So, obviously, they had access to gold. Shadavahana may have used gold as bullion because they did not issue gold coin. Very, very, very important. They did not issue gold coins even though they had Kolar gold fields within their control. So, historians believe that probably Shadavahanas used gold as bullions and not as coins. Shadavahana coins were mostly made of lead. They also used potin, copper, bronze, etc. for money. And Shadavahanas were succeeded by Ikshwahus. Okay. So, just like the Mauryas and just like any other kingdom at that time, Shadavahanas were also very much uh, aware of the art of paddy transplantation. And between the rivers of Krishna and Godavari, Shadavahana basically converted the land into a rice bowl using this art of paddy transplantation. Okay, they also produced cotton in abundance. Okay, the Deccan region, very famous for the Deccan traps, volcanic area, black soil. So, cotton production, very logic. Okay, they always associate, you know, think, think of history using logic. That explains a lot of things to you. You don't have to buy hard any of these things. Just by identifying the geography, you can identify a lot about individual dynasties. So, in general, from all these as things that I have said so far, it is very clear that Shadavahanas had a very advanced rural economy. Okay, rice, cotton, iron plowshare, paddy transplantation. Okay, all these points to a very advanced rural economy. And through the contact with Northern India, people of Deccan also learned to use coins, burn bricks, ring wells, art of writing and similar other stuffs. The one of the very important sites is actually Peddavankur. Peddavankur in Karimnagar district. Here we find evidences of fire baked bricks. Similarly, perforated roof tiles as well as flat roof tiles. All these are found in Peddavankur, which is a very typical site of Shatavahana period. Okay, so roof tiles are very common in Kushana constructions. I have already mentioned this earlier. Okay, but they were much more used in Deccan and Western Indian regions under Shatavahanas. Roof tiles, which is found in Kushana period, is much more abundantly used by the Shatavahanas in Western and Deccan region of India. These sites also have covered underground drains. Okay, another feature of Shatavahana period. We also see increasing trade. Uh, you know, we find more and more Shatavahana coins and you know Roman coins, etc., etc., from this period, which all points to the fact that trade has been flourishing at this point of time. Now, regarding social organization, again, use logic. I already told you the ruler was Brahmana, or at least he claimed to be a Brahmana. So, originally, historians believe that Shatavahanas were a Deccan tribe, okay, some tribal people in Deccan, but they've got Brahmanized. At least they claim to be Brahmanas. Okay, so Gaudami Putra Shatagarni, the first important king, he himself claimed as Brahmana. And he himself claimed to have established the fourfold Varna system, which earlier for, you know, fell into disorder. Okay, the fourfold system, which was growing big, was again revitalized and established further powerful by Gaudami Putra Shatagarni. At least he claimed so. Okay, so how would be the social organization? Social organization will be very strictly following the fourfold Varna system. Okay, but it can't be as smooth as that. Why? Because foreigners has entered India. We have Shakas, etc. who came to India. So, absorption of these foreigners into the Brahmanical society was something very peculiar in this period of time. Okay. So, absorption of the Shakas in Brahmanical society as Kshatriyas was facilitated by intermarriage between Shakas and Shatavahanas. Okay. So, there happened Shak, uh, intermarriage between Shakas and Shatavahanas, Shatavahanas being prominently Brahmanas, at least claiming to be Brahmanas, and Shakas prominently being Kshatriyas or converted into Kshatriyas because they were of warrior class. Okay, and Shatava, very important point for prelims, Shatavahanas were the first rulers to make land grants to Brahmanas. Very, very, very important. Shatavahanas were the first important rulers to, sorry, 
uh, rulers to make land grants to brahmanas okay i'm sorry about that uh, is there any eraser here ah never mind okay we'll continue later anyway uh, in this period we find increasing craft and commerce and you know increasing trade increasing economy so overall the economy flourished and among the artisans we find the term gandhigas gandhigas means perfumers they, they they are represented or they are denoted repeatedly uh, in the you know uh, inscriptions or in the literature that are available from this period gandhigas gandhigas means perfumers but eventually at a later stage the same term gandhigas has been used to represent all shopkeepers okay earlier we talked about the term yavana Yavana is a term you earlier used to denote Greeks, but eventually it began to become a term which was used to for denoting every foreigner. Similarly, here the term Ganthiga actually originally represented perfumers, but eventually it came to be used for any shopkeeper. Okay, and the modern title Ganthi is said to have been derived from this an ancient term. Ganthi came from Ganthiga. Okay, so sorry, uh, the in the North India, the Aryan society was very typical, and in Aryan society, we talked about you know patriarchal system and all. Father was very important. Father was the head of a family, and more important than mother. But Shatavahana uh, uh, period is something very curious. Why? Because Shatav in Shatavahana society, we find traces of matrilineal social structure. Best example, the name of the king is customarily derived from his mother, Gautami Putra, okay, which means what? Son of Gautami. So, Gautami is the name of mother. So, Gautami Putra Shadagarani. So, the name is actually derived from mother. Similarly, Vasishti Putra. So, son of Vasishti. So, Vasishti is the mother. So, mothers began to become very important in Shatavahana system. Okay, and we find that sometimes an inscription is issued both under the authority of king and his mother. So these are evidences of matrilineal systems within the Shatavahana society. Queens uh, made important religious gifts in their own right and sometimes acted as regents also. But despite all these things, historians still tend to believe that Shatavahanas were more or less patriarchal. Okay, basically they were patriarchal. Why? Because the crown passed from male to male. Okay, after the king, it doesn't pass to the daughter or anything, it doesn't pass to the mother, it goes to the next male member, male heir. So since the crown passes through the male male lineage, uh, Sadavahanas are also considered to be a patriarchal society, although some matrilineal features are seen in their society. Regarding their administration, they strove for a you know royal ideal set forth by dharma shastras again very logical they are brahmanas so they will follow the dharma shastras tooth to nail okay so king was considered as the upholder of dharma his it was his duty to maintain the distinction between all the four varnas all right so the shadavahana king is represented as possessing you know mythical qualities etc just like you know rama bhima keshava arjuna all these are brahmanical writings right so they all associated themselves with you know these kinds of concepts but more or less for us in a historical perspective shatavahanas maintained the administrative structures of ashokan times the district was called as ahara in mauryan time also district were known as ahara the officials were known as amatyas and mahamatras just like in the mauryan times some differences are also there in administrative divisions because we have a division known as rashtra under the officer named as Maharashtrikas. Okay, military and feudal traits in administration of Shatavahanas are also very much visible. We already spoke about it because invariably, almost always, a Senapati was appointed provincial governor because they knew that they need a military personality to claim control over these newly acquired territories. So it was best to keep a Senapati as a provincial governor. Clear. So these kinds of patterns are seen in the administration. Now, administration in rural areas are done by Gaulmika. Gaulmika is more like a village headman. 
So rural administration is in the hands of Gaulmika. Okay. Now, military character of Shatavahana rule is evident from the common use of terms such as Kataka, Skandhavara, etc. in their inscription. So, all these points towards military, okay, military aspects. Similarly, we have evidences of military camps and settlements, etc. Whenever, you know, uh, king is around. So, basically, coercion played a key role in Shatavahana administration. Okay, I mean, using military means what? Using some kind of force. Rather than using a civilian head, Shadavahanas always more or less try to use military organization or military leaders to ensure pro proper administration. So historians believe that this points to the fact that coercion played a very important role in Shadavahana administration. Okay, earlier I mentioned that Shadavahanas gave land, were the first one to give land grants to Brahmanas. Clear. These land grants were actually tax-free. Tax-free villages were given to Brahmanas, not just Brahmanas, Buddhist souls. And once these lands were given, these lands were free from intrusion of royal policemen, soldiers and other officers. These were given as grants. Royal officers or policemen cannot enter these lands for any kind of purposes without their permission. Okay. In general, the society or the feudal, feudal class in the society was divided into three grades. Highest grades was formed by the king who was called the Raja. Okay, and it is he the only person who has the right to strike coins. He was the supreme one. Then comes the second grade forming Mahabhoja. And the last one, third grade, Senapati. So three hierarchies can be seen in the Shatavahana society, uh, in the Shatavahana feudal society. That is number one, the king. Underneath him, you have the Mahabhoja. And underneath him, you have the Senapati. So these kinds of three grades of feudatories are visible in Shatavahana society. Regarding religion, they were all Brahmins. I'm going a bit quick here because I have explained these points over and over again earlier. Okay, Shatavahana rulers were basically Brahmanas. Kings and queens therefore obviously performed lots and lots of Vedic sacrifices including uh, Ashwamedha, Vajapaya and all these things. They gave huge sacrificial fees etc. to Brahmanas. They worshipped large number of Vaishnava gods such as Krishna, Vasudeva, etc. But they also promoted Buddhism. Okay, they also promoted Buddhism. Nagarjuna Kunda and Amaravati in Andhra Pradesh became very important seats of Buddhism. That is the best example. Nagarjuna Kunda, Amaravati, all these are prominent Buddhist sites. So, this was continued by Ikshvahus also, who were the successors of Shatavahanas. Now, okay, more or less no change in that area. Regarding architecture, for Buddhist monks, they built lots of chaityas, lots of monasteries called viharas, etc, etc. And some of them were cut out of solid rock. Best example is the Karle Caves in Western Deccan. Okay, viharas or monasteries were excavated near chaityas for residents of monks during rainy season. I hope you know the difference between a chaitya and a vihara. Chaitya means, what is a chaitya? Chaitya basically means a prayer hall. Vihara is the residence area. This is where the uh, Buddhist monks live and Shaitya is the place where they pray. Okay. Now, we also see many independent Buddhist structures here. Most famous ones being constructed in Amaravati and Nagarjuna Kunda. Amaravati stupa is full of sculptures that depict scenes from the life of Buddha. Okay. Nagarjuna Kunda prospered even more under the patronage of his, their successors, that is Ikshvahus. We will study more about Nagarjuna Kunda, Amaravati, Madhura, Gandhara or during our uh, you know art and culture classes that is why i am not spending too much time here we have to study about individual sculptures what are the materials used for you know making them the color the style etc etc all that will be taken detailed in art and culture classes okay language official language of satavahanas was prakrit okay i mean sanskrit was obviously the brahmanized language and all but still official language by satavahanas were prakrit only they continued the Ashogan practice. Okay, all their inscriptions were written in Brahmi script, just like Ashoka. And you know, one of the Prakrit textbook called as Gathas Gatha Sattasai or Gatha Saptasati. This is attributed to a particular Satavahana king named as Hala. This is a prelims question. Gatha Sattasai or Gatha Saptasai. This is the Saptasati. This is actually attributed to. Shatavahana King Hala. This is also a Prakrit textbook. 
that brings us to the end of second chapter the shatavahana phase now we move further south the dawn of history in deep south okay any questions let me see uh okay too many comments in the chat uh i let me see if i missed any questions uh yeah satya's question about feudal practices i think i have already answered okay please uh if you have any further questions you can always put it in the chat i will definitely look into it and make sure i do not miss it okay now moving on to the third chapter uh thank you for being patient with me and thank you for being uh, you know attentive in the class and all so i have to cover two more chapters today i won't take it too fast but i will go in this particular pace the class might get extended to 15 minutes more than usual okay so tomorrow i mean yeah tomorrow also there will be a class and tomorrow i will be taking the gupta period two chapters club together the gupta era and then the post gupta phase and finally the vartana phase the harsha vartana and you know that all so within two three classes ancient india will be over and then i will be starting the the art and culture textbook that too will be rounded out by july 15th before july 15th i will end this whole thing okay and uh, individual classes on dowry as well as on uh, say main sense writing that will be taken later i i haven't forgot on that that is very important and i will definitely do it okay so the megalithic background so when we speak about south india in this period first important thing that you have to think about is megalithic background in the ashokan times also we talked about this megaliths are typical features of south india okay so this is uh, you know from the prehistoric period the change to the beginning of historical period is marked by some important features and these features are settlement of large scale rural communities iron plowshare formation of state system rise of social classes introduction of writing introduction of metal coinage and beginnings of written literature these are the features that mark the shift from prehistorical period to historical period okay up to the second century bc the upland portions of the peninsula okay the you know plateau region upland portions they were inhabited by people known as megalith builders so what are these megaliths megaliths are basically large stone structures typically used for burial purposes in south india once you know person is dead he or she was actually buried and huge stone structures are erected on top of these burials these structures are known as megaliths clear so megaliths are, were very common in south india at this point of time and in these megalithic burials we have not only found many skeletons of people but also pottery and iron objects so why would you bury pottery and iron iron objects along with these burials because people believed that after death in the after life this this person can use all these things okay they believed that in the after life the person can use all these pottery and iron objects etc etc to live the life there for that purpose these kinds of things were also buried clear okay? so we find you know uh, various types of pottery including red ware but black and red ware seems to have been popular here so in south india unlike everywhere you know elsewhere in india black and red ware was much more common than red ware okay so now let's see the megalithic background in comparison to the you know number of agricultural tools that were buried most of them were actually meant for fighting and hunting so we find many number of tools some of them were used as agricultural tools some of them were used for hunting and uh, fighting purposes but more number of tools associated with fighting and hunting were buried rather than agricultural tools so from this the historians think that megalithic people did not practice advanced type agriculture if they had practiced advanced type agriculture they should have buried more and more agricultural tools not hunting and fighting tools but it had it we find evidence otherwise so for that matter we believe that 
the megalithic culture or the megalithic people at this point of time did not practice advanced type agriculture okay some of the south indian kingdoms are mentioned by ashokan inscriptions for example cholas pandyas kerala putras also known as cheras etc etc they all belong to the late megalithic phase clear so they were you know these megalithic people they lived in the areas in the southern districts of tamil nadu here we find a very peculiar thing that the buried buried skeletons are actually found in urns made of red pottery so urn burial is seen in south, south india especially the tamil nadu region and in many cases these urns were not surrounded by stone circles okay i already told you in megalithic burials we find large stones on top of the burial or sometimes we see stone circles okay like this circles made of stone is also a typical feature of burial in megalithic phase but in tamil nadu in during the urn burial areas we do not sometimes we do not even see these kinds of structures these uh, these you no know, stone structures all right we also have evidences where we find only skeleton and not many other things other tools or anything okay so very and there, there were you know lots and lots of differences between different areas in south india itself okay so despite the use of iron megalithic people preferred the slope of the skill the slope of the hills for settlement and funerary structures this is another important very curious thing they knew about iron they knew about iron plowshare yet they did not live in you know plain lands they lived in mountain slopes and hills all right why probably because they knew about iron and plowshare and all but they were not that you know uh, they did not use it in an abundant scale or they were not you know uh, they did not had that kind of abundance of these kinds of tools so for that reason they continued to live on hill slopes and you know uh, other area river banks etc etc and they did not encroach too much into the forests in the early period it is only very late that they get more and more amount of iron tools and they encroach into forests and starts to clear forests and live in plain land state formation and the development of civilization so uh, in the second century bc megalithic people started to move from upland area into fertile river basins only in the second century bc does the megalithic people move from upland to fertile regions so that means what that means by this time more and more iron and more and more such things has started to percolate to south india from north india okay so contact of the material culture from north india through traders through conquerors through jaina and buddhist and brahmanical missionaries okay all these uh, practices started to percolate into their society from north india this led them to change their lifestyle change their you know practices etc etc they began to be acquainted with the paddy cultivation they this led to the foundation of numerous villages and towns etc etc this developed social classes okay so the cultural and economic contacts between the north and the tamilagam began to become very very important so tamilagam means what tamilagam is the region that we are talking about this south indian region where the modern day tamil nadu and uh, parts of kerala exists the whole region is known as tamilagam so the contact between tamilagam and the northern empires was very vital in this you know cross culture composition okay and these contacts we are missionaries we are traders we are invaders happened through dakshinapada okay in india there were prominent roads at that time we have uttarapada dakshinapada etc etc okay and dakshinapada was one of the most important routes used by the northerners to come to south and south southerners to go to north clear and through these routes there has to there had been lots and lots of exchanges between south and north via gold pearls precious stones etc etc megasthenes who visited ashoka uh, sorry mauryan kingdom during the time of chandragupta maurya uh, he talks about pandya state very famous for pearls and all i talk i think i talked about this when we studied chandragupta maurya okay so we have evidences of these kinds of kingdoms existing in south india from 
writings of Megasthenes in Indica. We also have evidences of the flourishing trade between South India and Roman Empire because we find lots and lots of coins of Roman origin in South Indian region. All the South Indian kingdoms such as Cholas, Cheras, Pandyas, all of them had very good trade relationship with Roman Empire. All right. Now let's look into them one by one. Chola, Pandya, Chera or Kerala. Cheras are also known as Kerala. Kerala Putras. Modern day Kerala region. Okay, we won't go into depth because we have already covered them in depth in medieval Indian chapters. But in medieval India, we have studied about their second phase. Okay, the earlier parts of these dynasties, Chola, Pandya and Chera, all happened in the ancient phase, in the in, uh, you know, later part of the ancient phase. That is what we are going to look into. Okay, we will look into some important points and move on. That's it. So Pandyas, you know, they were first mentioned by Megasthenes. I already spoke about that. It, he calls it as the kingdom of pearls and all. He also speaks of it being ruled by a woman. Okay, so Pandyas have also something to do with matriarchal influence. We find some in evidence of matrilineal society in Shatavahanas. Pandyas also have something similar. All right. Southernmost and southeastern portion of Indian Peninsula were occupied by these Pandyan kings and they had their capital at Madurai in Tamil Nadu. Not the Mathura in UP, Madurai in Tamil Nadu. Okay, Sangam literature also talks a lot about the Pandya rulers. They, but they do not provide much of a you know, coherent account. They have something on Pandya rulers but not enough. But from whatever we have from Sangam literature, it is very clear that Pandyas were wealthy and prosperous. They had this trade relationship with the Roman Empire. Ambassadors to the Roman Empire, Emperor Augustus was sent by the Pandians. Also, Brahmanas enjoyed considerable influence in the society. All these are very clear from the Sangam literature available to us on Pandyas. As far as Cholas were concerned, their territory lo was located towards the northeast of Pandyas, between the rivers Pennar and Belar. Between the rivers of Pennar and Bela is the kingdom of Cholas, early Cholas. Sangam text obviously speaks about them also. And we from that we know that Urayur is a very prominent area. One of their capitals, Urayur, very prominent for cotton trade. And from their text, these Sangam textbooks, we also come to understand that Elara, very famous Chola king Elara, he conquered Sri Lanka and ruled Sri Lanka for a period of 50 years. But the major Cholas, as we speak, starts from Karigala Chola. Karigala Chola founded the next capital of Cholas or the city of Puhar. And Puhar is identical with the modern day Kaveri Patna. Why? Because it is in the banks of river Kaveri. That's it. This was the later capital of Cholas. And since they have all these rivers and they are a coastal region and all, Cholas had a very efficient navy. They conquered Sri Lanka. So obviously they should have a proper navy. Okay. So Cholas maintained an efficient navy. Now, apart from Cholas and Pandyas, the other important king, uh, kingdom is Cheras. Essentially, Karigala Cholas successors were weak. Okay. I am not talking about Rajendra and Rajaraja Chola. They come later in the medieval period. We already talked about them. They come towards the end of ancient period. Okay. So Karigala, uh, so... Uh, up, to, uh, up till Rajaraja Chola and Rajendra Chola, Karigala's successors, they were very weak. Okay, so because of that, the Pandyas and Cheras were able to expand their empires at the cost of Cholas. Basically, finally, Pallavas managed to completely vanquish the Chola power. Clear, at this point of time. Then Cholas will re-emerge again through Rajaraja Chola, Rajendra 1, etc, etc. But that happens, you know, later. As far as the Cheras are concerned, they ruled over the Kerala region. So towards the west and north of the Pandya territory, which is the Tamil Nadu region. They also had proper contact with the Romans in trade and all. Romans set up two regiments in Mussuris. Mussuris is a place in Chera state, very important for ancient trade. Okay, right now we have the Mussuris Binale and all. So that place is still very important. It's in modern day Kochi. Okay. So, uh, Kerala Putras or the Sheras were very prominent state at that point of time. And it is said that they also built their a temple of Augustus. So, in the Chera kingdom, we also have a temple of Augustus. 
Okay, and according to the Chera poets, the greatest among the Cheras was Senguttavan. Senguttavan literally means red or good Chera. Okay, red or good Chera means Senguttavan. And uh, I mean, there has been lots and lots of exaggerations in, in this ancient literature and all. And it says that he invaded the north and crossed the river Ganges and all. I mean, exaggerations, nothing true. Okay, North India was ruled by Kushanas, Shagas and all these people. And there is no way South Indian Cheras and all managed to pass Ganges at this point of time. No. So these are basically exaggerations written by the poets uh, who lived in those times. Although these you know, states were weakened by constant wars between each other, still they profited with their natural resources and their trade. So immense natural resources. Even now we have the Western Ghats and all, very much abundant of natural resources. So with the natural resources and with the trade with Romans and other parts of the world like Malaya, Malaya region, Sri Lanka, China, etc, etc. These South Indian states continued to flourish despite their interwar, inter quarrels. Okay. And when Egypt became a Rom, uh, you know, Roman province, monsoon was also discovered. Okay. Around that time, monsoon was also discovered and the discovery of monsoon helped the trade to become even more smoother. Okay, the overseas trade became even more smooth by the invention of monsoon. I think you know why. Obviously, you know why. You can use the monsoon winds. At that time, you do not have the steam powered ships and all. So, you have to depend entirely on the wind. So, by understanding the pattern of monsoon winds, they could easily plan their journey. South India was very famous for the spices and all the, okay, especially pepper and all these things. Ivory was also very important here because of the you know, elephants and all. And obviously, already told you, Pandyas were very famous for pearls and all, you know, muslin, silk, cotton cloth. All these were extremely popular in different, different parts of the world. So, immense trade happened between these South Indian kingdoms and rest of the world. And gold coins and silver coins all came from different parts of the world into South India. We find immense number of Roman coins in South India. Okay, but eventually... With the decline of this trade, all these kingdoms began to decay. So, how did this trade decline? We will talk about in the upcoming slide. So, the purse and the sword. Real foundation of war and polity lay in the regular income from agriculture. Okay, despite all these things, economy was made more or less agriculture. Okay, you have trade, you have constant wars and all, but still, agriculture was very primary. Earlier in the megalithic period, it was not like that. Hunting was more, more prominent. But eventually, by the time of Chola, Seras and Pandyas, it became, agriculture they began to get the upper portion, upper uh, step. Okay, so obviously, once the agriculture was started and practiced in a higher level, taxation, the system of taxation came into force. King began to collect a particular amount of agricultural produce as tax. And eventually, more and more land was brought under agriculture. And obviously, you know, South India is filled with rivers. So, a lot of extremely fertile land, uh, very much, you know, water resources are available. You know, uh, so, crops like paddy, ragi, sugarcane, etc. Okay, water intensive crops were cultivated a lot. And out of all these taxes collected by the king, the king was able to maintain a very rudimentary army. A standing army was finally in place thanks to the taxes collected from all these people. Okay, so a typical army in South India at that time consisted of chariots, elephants, Cavalry, infantry, etc. Remember, chariots were drawn by oxen. Okay, horses were more or less used independently by this time. We have the cavalry unit separate. Chariots in South India were more or less used by oxen. I mean, horses were also used, but majority by oxen. Now, social classes. What is the social class uh, different? Uh, what is the character of social classes at this time? Or what are the social classes that evolved in this time? Okay, so no questions that I can see. So, Brahmanas first appear in the Tamil land in the Sangam age. Clear? So, from the North India, finally the Brahmanism, the Aryan system, finally managed to percolate all the way to South. And Brahmanas appear in the Tamil region for the first time in Sangam age. Okay, and there was a particular ideal. Okay, an ideal king was the one who never hurt Brahmanas. Okay, I mean, very... You can obviously understand the uh, source, how the society thinks or how the society has been modeled at that time. 
Brahman has obviously wanted the upper, you know, section, upper power, upper hand in everything. So an ideal king is somebody who do not hurt Brahmana. Okay. Now, many Brahmanas functioned as, you know, poets and, you know, their role was generally very much rewarded by the kings and all. Tamil Brahmanas partook of meat and wine. Okay, they used to have all these things. Kshatriyas and Vaishyas appear as regular Varnas in Sangam textbooks. Captains of armies were invested with the title of Enadi. So, this is another important question in prelims. Enadi. Enadi is a term used for denoting the captains of army in the Tamilagam region. Okay, Enadi in the Sangam age. Civil and military officers were both, you know, uh, held properly under the period of, you know, Cholas and Pandyas, etc, etc. And both civil and military officers were actually held by a particular section of the society known as Vellalas. Vellalas means rich peasants. They were the people who dominated in the civil and military offices. Okay, the ruling class was known as Arashar. And the members of, uh, its members had marriage relationship with Lalas who formed the fourth caste. So, Vellalas are the rich peasants, Arashas are the ruling class. Enadis are the captains of Tamilagam military. Clear? And the agricultural operations, the menial work was done by the lower classes, lowest classes. They were known as Kadaisia. Okay? And there is one final class that is Pariyar. Pariyar means those people who worked as agricultural laborers and also worked with animal skins. So the lowest sections were considered uh, as say Parisiyas and in the agricultural level, the lowest classes were the Kadaisia. All right. So there were, you know, people who were considered as, uh, you know, outcasts and you know, untouchables, etc, etc, as forest tribes and all. So there existed sharp social inequality. Obviously, from this, I think you have understood that there was proper uh, inequality in the society in social matters as well as in economic matters. But the acute caste distinctions that we see in the later phases did not exist in the Sangamish. Okay, now we have different castes and all and, you know, hierarchies, etc, etc. That kind of caste hierarchy never existed in the Sangamish. That is something that happened very late. But even then, there was social as well as economic imbalances during the period of Sangam age. So, as I have told you, Brahmanism found itself for the first time in Sangam period in the South Indian region. Okay, so we can find a lot of Brahmanical influence confined in the Tamil Nadu territory of modern era. But it is again towards or targeted towards the upper levels of Tamil society. Again, Brahmanism, uh, just like North India, in South India also, Brahman, Brahmanism occupied the upper classes of the society. Kings performed Vedic sacrifices. Okay, Brahmanas who were the followers of Vedas conducted disputations. Clear, typical Brahmanical character was evolving in South India also. The, uh, the chief local god was actually the hilly god of Murugan. Murugan is actually a tribal god. Murugan is known as the god of the hilly region. But eventually, Murugan became a Brahmanical god. And he got the name Subramanya. Clear? So, this is all examples of the Brahmanization that is happening in South India. Since the beginning of Sangam age. We also find uh, mentions of the worship of Lord Vishnu. Again, a Brahmanical god. Megalithic practices of providing for the dead continue. Okay, paddy being offered to the dead. I mean, even now we have these practices, right? After a person dies, we do certain rites and all, uh, where, you know, some sort of food is actually given to the dead. Okay, that practice has continued just like we had from the megalithic period and all. Cremation was introduced. Okay, earlier it was pot burial, pit burial, etc, etc. But now cremation has also been introduced, which is typical uh, Brahmanical thing. Yeah, but inhumation also followed. Okay, inhumation means what? Burying a person in the, underneath the ground. That is inhumation. That was there even before it. Now cremation got also in introduced, but inhumation continued. It was not, you know, abandoned or anything. All right. Now Tamil language and Sangam literature. Sangam, what does this Sangam mean? Sangam basically is a college or assembly of Tamil poets. That's it. Okay. And this was given patronization by the kings who existed at that point of time. 
and i mean some of the hist- you know tamil commentary says that there were three sangams in total and this lasted for 9990 years and was attended by 8598 poets and had 197 pandya kings as patrons none of it is true these are mere exaggerations okay none of these are uh, true all that we can be sure is that sangams had royal patronage especially in the regions of madurai that's the historical fact these numbers are mere exaggerations don't follow it all right so sangam literature can be roughly divided into two groups okay two major groups one is the narrative other one is the didactic so narrative means what narrative texts are you know uh, for example we have the uh, i will give you some examples but narrative texts are called as melkanaka melkanaka means or you know 18 major works and these comprises uh, they comprise 18 major works consisting of eight anthologies and 10 idylls okay these are narratives these narrate the stories of kings and conquerors and heroes and all narrative works then we have the didactic works what are these didactic works didactic works are moral stories okay certain certain directives for the kings or the people you have heard about these moral stories right that stories this impart some kind of messages these are known as didactic stories didactic works these form the keelkanak that is the 18 minor works keel means minor so keelkanak and melkanak melkanak is 18 major works and keelkanak means 18 lower works minor works okay so social evolution from sangam text so the narrative textbooks basically works are the works on heroic poetry i told you hero worship okay so from this textbook we we can identify some historical facts for example early megalithic people seem to be primarily pastoralists hunters fishermen etc etc but they also produced rice i told you agricultural implements were found but still majority implements were used for fighting and hunting so basically a pastoral hunting kind of society early megalithic period it is only in the late phase that we find agriculture beca- becoming more and more popular okay so these narrative texts also suggest that war booty was a very prominent source of livelihood plenty of quarreling happened between different kinds of people and after each war lots and lots of loot is taken away and this also formed a prominent part of livelihood okay and in order to praise these heroes when these heroes die they are actually you know a stone is erected in their honor so the later practice raising hero stones or the virarkal is also something associated with the megalithic culture okay when a hero falls he is associated with a stone okay so nowadays we have this practice of erecting stones or some kind of structure in honor of that person that hero and this practice known as virarkal is actually associated with this particular age okay so earliest phase of social evolution reflected in the sangam works relates to the early megalithic stage so sangam age starts from early megalithic age from then from that period onwards is what is the context of sangam literature so these narrative sangam works actually gives us some idea about state formation obviously they are praising heroes and kings and all so they talk all about you know warriors and all so taxation system judiciary trade merchants farmers all these are mentioned in these narrative textbooks so we can have a picture of the society at that time using these textbook textbooks some of these textbooks are you know including the didactic ones were written by brahmana scholars of prakrit or sanskrit not all sangam works are tamil okay some of them were actually written by brahmanas of prakrit and sanskrit the text also refer to grants of villages and also descendants of king from solar and lunar dynasties surya vamsha chandra vamsha okay these are the solar and lunar dynasties so descendants and lineages from these dynasties etc are also mentioned in sangam textbooks some of the prominent textbooks are tolp kapiyam apart from these narrative and didactic textbooks we have some secular works for example tolp kapiyam that is a work on grammar and poetics tirukkural tirukkural is a book on philosophy and wise maxims silappadigaram 
which depicts the love story in which Kovalan prefers a certain courtesan named as Madhavi uh, to his wedded wife Kannagi. So this Silapadigaram, uh, whose author is a Jaina, is also a typical work from the Sangamish. Who is the author of Silapadigaram? It is Ilango Adigal. So this is another prominent book from Sangamish. Mani Meghalai. Mani Meghalai is like a sequel of Silapadigaram. It is actually written by a grain merchant and it has the adventures of adventures of the daughter born of the union between Kovalan and Madhavi. Okay, the story of Kovalan's love to Madhavi over his wife Kannagi is there in Silapadigaram. And Kovalan and Madhavi's daughter, Manimegale's adventures are written in this particular textbook known as Manimegale. And this textbook is written by Sittalai Satana. two prominent Sangam books. Okay. So that by this we come to the end of Sangam age also. Final chapter craft, trade and towns in post Mauritius. Okay. That's it. Uh, after that we are done for today. I told you today's class is a bit long. I'm sorry for that. I'm taking too much contents also. I know it. But at any point of time, if you feel saturated, please, you know, take some rest and watch the rest of the video at a later point. If you have any queries at any point of time, you can contact me personally through WhatsApp or to Telegram. My contact number is given there. You can also ask your doubts in the comment section in YouTube. I will check it occasionally and if there are any doubts posted, I will definitely post your answers there. Okay, so final chapter for the day, crafts, trade and towns in post Maurya age. Okay. I mean, it's not, it's a, like a fourth cast. Okay. I mean, uh, we were talking about whom? Vellalars, right? I think we are talking about Vellalars when we spoke about that fourth cast. Where is it? Yes. The ruling class was uh, called as Arisar and its members had a marriage relationship with Vellalars who formed the fourth cast. It's not a class kind of thing. We, we are not talking about the Varna system. Okay, we are not talking about Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra. No, we are actually talking about the different sections that existed in the Tamilaga. Okay, we have the uh, you know Arasar, Kadashiyar, Pariyar, and Vellala. These are the four you know sections that existed in Tamilaga. So in the in this textbook, in the NCRT textbook of uh, 11th standard, it is called as it, it is considered Vellalas are considered as a fourth caste in Tamilaga. That's all. Not the typical caste as we see today. Okay, don't take that term caste in the meaning that we take it in the modern day. All right. Any questions? Other here we find different stratification of society. What existed in northern? Yes, here in South India also there exists difference in society, but we do not see the same stratification. In North India we have clearly different varna system. Brahmana, Kshatriya, Shudra, Vaishya, Vaishya and Shudra. But in South India, Brahmanism has finally arrived in South India. Kshatriyas are also there. But we do not find these Vaishyas and Shudras typically in South India. Okay, Vaishya and Shudra classifications are not that much marked in South India at this point of time. And in, in the time period that we are speaking about, the Sangam age. But instead, we have a classification like Arasir, Vellalas, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, the other other two also uh, forgot the name. Arasia the ruling class, Vellala Sirish presence, Kadesia the uh, uh, you know uh, agricultural laborers and Pahiyas who are the uh, agricultural laborers who also work in uh, with animal skin. Okay, we do not exactly find a full flourished Vaishya and Shudra class in South India as it existed in North India in the Sangamish. Okay, but social stratification is obviously there. Economical stratification is also there. Huge inequality in the social structure. So coming to final chapter for the day, crafts, trade and towns in post Maurya age. Most maybe maximum 20 minutes more and I will finish it. Okay. It, it won't go for 20 minutes. This is a small chapter. Uh, maybe like uh, six, seven slides. That's all. So craft. Okay. Basically, this is very simple. Most flourishing period in history as far as craft and commerce is concerned is this period that we are talking about. Okay, the very famous textbook Vika Nikhaya. Vika Nikhaya is a textbook that deals with Buddhism and this textbook actually gives us a lot of insight about pre-Mauryan times. 
pre-Mauryan, not post-Mauryan, pre-Mauryan times. Okay, and this textbook mentions only around you no know, two dozen occupations. Okay, two dozen occupations. So Viganagaya mentions about twenty-four kinds of occupations in pre-Mauryan times. But Mahavastu, which relates to the period that we are talking about, the Sangam age and you know post-Mauryan period, Mahavastu actually catalog catalogs around thirty-six kinds of workers. living in the town of rashkir and this list is not exhaustive similarly milinda pano again that speaks about the post mauryan period talks about as many as 75 occupations 60 of which are con uh, connected with various kinds of crafts so from this it is very clear that this is the the post mauryan period witnessed a huge enhancement in crafts and commerce obviously right the job has you know diversified a lot more and more jobs are created at least more and more categories of jobs has come along from these literary works it is very clear from us uh, for us so eight of these crafts were associated with the working of gold silver lead tin copper brass iron and other precious metals we, we can in, in general we can say that we find a lot and lot of different varieties of crafts some of them with metals such as brass zinc antimony etc etc okay so from these kinds of notations given in these textbooks it is very clear that there has been great advancements and specializations in mining and metallurgy right otherwise why would you mention all these metals it is said that crafts associated with all these metals has been practiced so that itself gives you the idea that mining and metallurgy was very much important or very much practiced and advanced and specialized in this period obviously iron works were also in progress by this time because i know the pastoral economy became, began to become agricultural economy thanks to iron plow share so iron works also began to become very very common indian iron and steel including cut cutlery cutlery okay indian iron and steel along with indian cutlery etc were exported to the abyssinian ports and it was widely in demand in the western asian regions technique of cloth making silk weaving manufacturing of arms and luxury etc etc also developed all these are points that i have mentioned earlier itself okay i already told you urayur etc in the chola region was extremely famous for cotton making silk sugarcane cotton etc were very much popular in this point of time at this point of time mathura in north india was a great center of manufacture of special type of cloth known as shataka very important for films shataka is a particular type of cloth a special type of cloth that has been exported from mathura in uttar pradesh okay we also find evidence of a brick built dyeing vat from urayur urayur is a center of uh, you know cotton cloth from there we also find evidences of dyeing okay brick built dyeing vat similar dyeing vats are also excavated from arikamedu arikamedu is another prominent area of econ you know Uh, commerce okay so we also think that oil manufacturing increased around this period thanks to the arrival of oil wheel because of the use of oil wheel oil manufacturing also started to flourish around this time other important works were iron ivory work glass manufacturing bead cutting shell industry etc etc coin minting is another prominent uh, you know manufacturing area and this period is noted for numerous types of coins made of numerous types of metals such as gold silver copper bronze lead glass potin etc etc fake roman coins made by indian artisans are also very much abundant in these times okay we also find beautiful terracotta works best example of terracotta works is found in yelleshwaram yelleshwaram is in nalgonda district all right and here is the this is the region from where we find the largest number of terracottas and their molds but historians believe that terracottas were largely used by the upper classes in towns and not the lower classes why because we see a significant decline of terracottas in the post gupta period in the post gupta period there is a decline in towns okay i mean at, at least i mean not just in, not in the post gupta period at least in the towards the end of gupta period starts and in the post gupta period it is very clear so uh, at that time we find that terracotta figurines become less and less 
So historians associate terracotta figurines with the upper sections of the society who lived in towns, prominent towns. Okay. So virtually by the time of the post Gupta period, these terracotta figurines are completely absent. Now artisans were organized into guilds. Okay, this guild system, which we already talked about in ancient India, in Ashokan period and all, it, it was there in South India also. It was there in the post Mauryan period also. These guilds were known as Shrenis. Okay, I think I, you already know that. So there is a book, uh, which the English translation of which is actually the Garland of Madurai. Okay, in this book, it talks about the important uh, importance of you know shopkeepers and merchants and all the, the economy of this period and all. Okay, and here. The importance of shopkeepers is indicated by the repetition of a particular term known as apana. Okay, also in the description of the city of Sakala. So the city of Sakala is mentioned in this textbook as a very flourishing city of shopkeepers who are indicated by a repeated term as apana. We also find these artisans and merchants organizing into different guilds called as Shreni. Shreni is sometimes also known as Ayatana. Okay, guilds are also sometimes known as Ayatana. But how these organizations functioned, that is not indicated in any of the textbooks from this time, like, you know, Mahabastu or Melindapana. It is not given there. From these textbooks, we know that such things existed. But how did they function? That is not given in these textbooks. Some of the, uh, but from these textbooks, it's very clear that both merchants and craftsmen were divided into high, low and middle ranks. Earlier itself we saw the society was clearly stratified. Maybe not exactly based on the Varna system as it existed in the Northern Indian region. But even then, there was clear social stratification in South India also. So we have craftsmen and merchants also being divided into high, low and middle ranks based on their economical status and social status etc. etc. Buddhist texts mention Sreshti. Sreshti was the chief merchant of a Nigama. And Sarthavaha is actually the caravan leader, who was the head of a corporation of merchants known as Vanish Grama. Okay, Vanish means what? Economy. And Vanish Grama basically means a corporation of merchants. Okay, and uh, Sreshti means the chief of merchant of the Nigama. It, Nigama is like a you know, a Shreni, like a guild. So the chief of merchant of that area uh, is known as uh, Sreshti. Okay, and the, the caravan leader is known as Sarthaba. All right, these Buddhic texts also speaks about nearly half a dozen petty merchants known as Vanija. Petty merchants are known as Vanija. They dealt with, you know, fruits, roots, cooked food, you know, basic stuffs. Term Vyavahari is another very uh, curious thing that we see. Vyavahari literally means one who transacts business. But the term Vyapari or trader seems to be missing. We come across the term Vyavahari, but we do not see the term Vyapari. Vyapari means businessman. Vyavahari means person who is associated with transaction of business. I, I hope you understood the difference. So the term Vyavahari is there, but Vyapari is not there. The term Agrivanija appears to be obscure, but these merchants may have been predecessors of Agrivalas. So who are these Agrivalas and Agrivanija? These are wholesale merchants. Okay, so these terms are also there. I mean, Agrivanija is expected to be a predecessor of Agrawal. Historians believe that may not be true, may not be true, but historians tend to believe that Agrivanija basically is the older form of Agrawala. Agrawala means wholesale merchant. Regarding the trade routes and centers, there, were, there was a thriving trade between North India and South India and also India and uh, the Roman Empire, obviously. Initially, there was a substantial amount of trade conducted overland through the northwestern borders of India. But as I told you, there has been certain Central Asian com you know, commotions at this point of time, due to, especially due to the Scythians. Okay, so this led to the displacement of Shakas, Parthians, Kushans, etc, etc. So all this led to the dis uh, disruption of trade in the northwestern region, through the northwestern region. So since that point of time, since the first century AD, trade was conducted mainly through sea. Overland trade started to decrease and oversea trade started to increase. 
and around the beginning of the christian era monsoon was also very much understood and this actually further contributed to the rise in sea trade among the important seaports broj and sopara were the most important ones in the western port in the western port of uh, coast of india broj and sopara were the most important one and the eastern coast we have arikamedu and tamralipti tamralipti is in west bengal i hope you know that okay please make sure that you identify these positions in map so in western coast we have broj and sopara and in eastern coast we have arikamedu and tamralipti broj is the most important one uh, in this times all right shakas and kushanas also used two routes from northwestern frontier to the western sea coast they also dealt with the sea trade to reach the western sea coast they used two different routes and both of these routes converged in taxila and were also connected to the silk route so this is an elaborate trading network i hope you have the picture now shakas and kushanas who ruled over that area they connected to the western sea coast using two different trade routes which connected connected or intertwined in taxila and this was connected to silk route so a full chain of trade is there clear so the first of these routes linked taxila with the lower indus basin and the second route is the main route that is the uttarapatta earlier i mentioned this and ujjaini was very important because it was a meeting point of another very prominent route that started from Kausambi near Allahabad. Okay, so there was a very well established trade system, trade route in India at that point of time. So, although the volume of this trade between India and Rome seems to have been large, it was not conducted in the articles that we use in daily life. Okay, we think that uh, you know because of the large quantities of trade, it must be rice or say wheat or something like that, right? But most of this trade happened in luxury goods. okay and romans first started their trade with southernmost part of india they did not start the initially romans obviously had trade with north india also but initially they started trade with southernmost part of india and obviously the main category items that were exported were spices muslin pearl jewelry precious stones etc etc along with iron goods special cutlery and all all these things okay and certain articles were brought to india from china and central asia and then passed to rome also that also happened okay due to various reasons uh, this was easier okay rather than going directly overland from china all the way to rome but once the overseas trade developed some part of this actually started to go overseas so they came from china to india then from india to rome that also happened all right so establishment of this parthian rule in iran and neighboring areas started to create difficulties i mean india had cordial relationship with i mean trade relationship with parthians but parthians maintained that trade but they did not allow the trade to go through them to romans they did not want the westerners to flourish using this trade so although parthians themselves traded well with india they did not want to allow india straight through them to romans okay so they started to create difficulties in trade okay so the silk route had started to face some issues this also facilitated china to find another route to go to rome okay so this also facilitated china to send more and more goods through water overseas uh, overseas uh, trade trade methods and ships from china came to india and from india it was taken to rome this also flourished india's economy okay so india is an intermediary country now so obviously india can levy taxes india can do all sorts of things so it basically enhanced the economy of south indian kingdoms which are which are all located in the coastal regions okay so rome romans after importing all these spices and all from india they exported certain other items to india what are they they include wine wine amphorae and various types of pottery including lead okay lead was used by shatavahanas to make their coins lot of it was actually imported from rome in the form of coil strips 
okay but roman goods do not appear in any substantial quantities in north india all this happened with south india okay we do not find much of roman goods in north india that does not mean that romans did not trade with north india they did have trade with north india but prominently it was with south india only in taxila which is called you know coterminous with the modern day sircap in the northwestern frontier province of pakistan here we have yielded examples of greco roman sculpture in bronze arentine pottery which is again something a spe specific feature of uh, central asia west asia region arentine pottery is also very frequently found in south india but it appears neither in central or western india or in afghanistan so this is again a roman thing arentine pottery so that is seen much more in south india but not at all seen in north india or west india so again that also points to the fact that romans had major trade relationship with south india and not other parts of india but the most significant export of romans to india is a large number of coins invariably of gold and silver sometimes copper also this is the major export why because they i mean those times people did not know about this idea of balance of trade okay so uh, most of this trade were conducted you know uh, using coins gold coins and all and obviously the trade was in favor of favor of india india's side so lots and lots of gold from different parts of the world came into india india was a sink of gold even back then all right we studied the same in medieval india we studied the same in modern india also until the british came to india in which the reverse trade started to happen reverse drain started to happen but until then india was the sink of gold okay so why why did the roman why was the trade balance favorable to india because there were certain goods in india which were extremely valued in western countries most importantly the indian pepper pepper was always very important uh, for the westerners because it made their meat much more eatable and because pepper was very much favorite of these greeks and romans it began to be known as yavana priya yavana means foreigner okay it, it actually means greeks but eventually the term yavana began to be used for calling any foreigners since pepper was very much favorite of these foreigners pepper began to be called as yavana priya the favorite of the foreigners in sanskrit there was also very strong demand for indian indian made steel cutlery okay but because of all this high quantity of trade in one direction not equally meted out in the other direction the trade balance was in favor of india and it began to affect the roman economy so there were huge reactions in rome against all these things just like what happened in britain when indian cotton were exported to britain in modern india okay so the romans started to impl you know implement certain trade restrictions with india so the loss of roman money was so deeply felt that eventually steps had to be taken in rome it that it banned its trade with india in pepper and steel goods so money was going into india so romans finally had to do something and they eventually banned trade of pepper and steel with india although roman traders lived in south india there is little evidence of indian residents living in rome that is also a very curious thing we have plenty of roman settlements in south india but we do not find much of indian settlements in rome but we have indian settlements in egypt okay last couple of slides money economy so roman gold coins were naturally valued for their intrinsic worth but they may have also circulated in major transactions okay on account of the contact with rome kushans issued the dinar type of gold coins which became very much abundant by the time of gupta period i already told you roman coins were imitated by indians a lot especially the gold and copper coins kushanas also imitated the dinar type of gold coins of Rome. Gold coins may not have been, you know, used in the day-to-day -day transactions, which were carried out in lead, copper. I mean, minor valued coins were made of lead, copper, platinum, etc., etc. Uh, major valued coins were the gold coins. So, gold coins are not something that used for that were used for daily day-to-day -day transactions. Okay, we already told that Shatavahanas did not issue gold coins, but the museum shows that. they seem to have issued the largest number of coins at this point of time not gold coins but out of all the coins that we find from this period most of them belongs to the shatavahanas so historians believe archaeologists believe that shatavahanas issued the most number of coins 
in the post mauryan period kushana issued the largest number of copper coins in northern and northwestern india these are all prelims points be very careful kushana issued the highest quality of gold coins kushana issued the largest number of copper coins in the north and northwest of india indo greeks were the first to introduce gold coins into india kushanas were the ones who made it more popular guptas were the people who had issued the most number of gold coins in india out of all the coins shatavahanas were the most to issue in you know any coin in india okay don't get confused with all these things just read download this pdf once i upload it in the telegram channel and read through it and you will definitely able be able to remember all these things all right so copper and bronze coins were used in large quantities by rulers of some of the indigenous dynasties like nagas who ruled over central india yaudeyas who ruled over the you know eastern part of rajasthan and all then you have the mitras who ruled over kausambi madura avanti ahichatra region so copper and bronze coin you no know, these minor valued coins were used in large quantities by certain local indigenous dynasties as well not too much important for us now the last topic for the day urban settlements before that is there are there any questions is it that economy in decentralized system flourished more than in centralized ones can we made any comparison between mauryan period and the later period especially when small kingdoms of and no 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 not like that we can't say as such we can't say in general that uh, say as uh, uh, in you know economy flourished more in decentralized system than in centralized uh, not exactly true uh as far as trade is in certain levels for example when we speak about harsha's period and all or say later gupta age and all we will say that the there existed a system of clear feudalism in india not the european model of feudalism but indian model of feudalism here land grants were much more given more and more because of these land grants more and more number of area of land were brought under agriculture okay and you know this led to the flourishing of economy so in that way we can say a, an amount of decentralization contributed to the flourishing of economy all right but here what we are seeing is not decentralization here we have individual different different kingdoms clear in chola system yes we have local self government and all so there is clear decentralization but in kushana period decentralization is in a different fashion it is a bit decentralized yes but not exactly the decentralization we usually talk about shatavahana we do not find much decentralization but still there is some land grants and all all right so in general we can say that in the post mauryan period we had more trade relationship with uh, romans and you know uh, and the uh, say uh, western nations the collapse of overland trade because of the confusions in central asia also contributed to the growth of south indian trade clear so the, the flourishing of economy is not merely attributed to the factor of decentralization but yes to an extent decentralization also played its role but lots of factors like monsoon collapse of overland trade in the uh, more and more you know uh, curiosity in, into the overseas trade the uh, demand of spices and all uh, in the roman region all these contributed to the further growth of trade between india and rome okay india and other countries and in general indian economy also kushanas controlling the uh, you know uh, silk route from there kushanas were able to levy lots of taxes and all so that also helped them to gain more and more tax uh, you know money and thereby enhance the economy so uh, decentralization is one of the factors among a lot of factors uh it's but in mauryan period also there was prop you know good trade relationship with different different countries maybe not with rome as such but still there are proper trade relationship with other countries uh during the time of say centralized countries centralized dynasties like moguls etc also we see trade has flourished gupta period also we see that there are you know in certain uh, uh, kinds of trade we have a drawback but in some other areas we see more and more trade happening okay so even when there are very strong centralized dynasties trade and commerce flourishes why because that such huge centralized dynasties helps to maintain peace in a larger area tolls will have to be levied only at the entry point 
okay if you have minor minor dynasties when you pass through each of these you have to pay taxes and tolls and all but if, it, if there is a centralized huge major dynasty you have to levy tolls only at the entrance similarly there will be you know much more stricter control over various regions no thefts and decoits and robbery and all these things more peace okay yeah, there, there won't be small quarrels between smaller smaller countries there will be peace in general so centralization also contributes to trade but in a different fashion okay so the flourishing economy cannot be merely attributed based on centralization or decentralization but among many other factors these can also contribute to it that's all now urban settlements last chapter last topic for the day only one more slide after this and it's done so the growth of this craft and commerce and the increasing use of money promoted the prosperity of numerous towns during this period obviously okay so these towns include vaishali padaliputra varanasi kausambi you no know, indraprastha etc etc because of all this we find superior constructions during the kushana age okay new towns coming up so superior constructions has to happen we already spoke about brick walls and you know roof tiles and all earlier itself current excavation shows that Sak saknan Quote, 50 kilometers from Lucknow to be the largest Kushana town in North India. Okay, Sachnan Court, 50 kilometers from Lucknow, is actually considered as the largest Kushana town in North India. In Gupta period, we see that structures were poorly built. Okay, and made use of the Kushana brick. So, in general, we will see that there is a decline in architecture during Gupta period that I will talk about more in Gupta chapters. Okay, but overall, on the old, the material remains from the Kushana phase indicate urbanization at its peak. Okay, the economy also obviously contributed to it. This also applies to the towns in Shaka Kingdom of Malwa and Western India. Most important town being Ujjaini. Okay, it, it is the meeting point of important trade routes and all. We already spoke about it. It also uh, is important because of its export of agate and carnelian stones. Okay, so Ujjaini also flourished. So the Shaka kingdom also was very, you know, important. Urbanization happened there also. In the Shatavahana kingdom also, we find many important towns such as Amiravati, Nagarjuna Kunda, Broj, Sopara, Arikamedu, Kaveri Patnam, so and so. Towns prospered in Kushana and Shatavahana empires because they conducted thriving trade with Roman Empire. This was very important. Trade with Roman Empire was a very important feature of the economic prosperity of post Mauryan period. Very, very important feature. Okay. Indian trade, Indians then traded with the eastern part of Roman Empire as well as Central Asia. Kushana Empire ensured security along the routes and its demise in the 3rd century dealt a great blow to these towns. So, fall of Kushanas caused a huge you know, collapse in economy in the 3rd century AD. Okay, Kushanas were very prominent and they were, they had contributed a lot to the trade. But once they collapsed, tra the overland trade through the northwestern part of India also found a huge barrier. So, trade collapsed. End of Shatavahana power, together with the ban on trade of India imposed by the Romans in the 3rd century, this also impoverished the Indian artisans and merchants. Shadavahanas, again a very prominent dynasty, when they declined, that also hindered the trade a lot. The, the ban on trade with uh, the spices and you know steel etc. with India, put forth by the Romans, this also you know inhibited Indian Roman trade a lot. All these impoverished the Indian artisans and merchants. So towards the end of post Gupta period, we see a decline in trade, decline in economy. Okay, now archaeological excavations in Deccan clearly suggests a decline in urban settlements after the Shatavahana phase because of the same. So once the once the trade collapsed, economy, the artisans, etc., etc., began to become poor. Once the emperors, the Shatavahanas and you know Kushanas, etc., collapsed, no more royal patronage, no more royal interventions into all these things. So the entire economy, you know, started to go down. And all, obviously, once the economy goes down. Urbanization also starts to, you know, decelerate and what it starts to reverse also. We will be, eventually we see a complete decline in urban, urban settlements in the post satavahana phase. Okay, so the next important kings who comes into fourth is the Gupta, are the Guptas. And in Gupta times, we see that again, everything comes back into track once again. And towards the end of Gupta period, everything goes 
downhill once again. Clear? So as far as the post maurian period is concerned, the major causes of economic decline towards the end of it can be attributed to the collapse of important dynasties such as Kushanas, Chatavahanas, etc. Collapse of Roman trade. Okay, the Roman trade uh, because of the restrictions imposed by you know the Romans in Indian trade. These two led to the economic decline, which led to the deceleration of urbanization, which led to decline of economy. Okay, so with that, we come to the end of today's session. I know it has been very long, sorry for that. But I hope you, you know, the time was worth it. I hope you studied something. I mean, you understood something uh, of what I have said. If you have any queries, please feel free to ask your doubts. You can put it in the YouTube chat or YouTube comment section or in the Telegram channel or WhatsApp me. My contact details are given in the Telegram channel. The link is given here. It is also given underneath the YouTube in the YouTube description session. So before you go, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel. Also, please share it with your, with your friends. Okay, so uh, next class is tomorrow only. Okay, and there's no break day from now onwards. Tomorrow, the next session will happen. It, two chapters from the Gupta period will be taken together. And we will move on every day with uh, you know, new and new chapters. Within three days, the entire ancient India portion will be completed. And then I will start with the art and culture sessions. And uh, before July 15th, I will wind this up. Okay, even then, even after July 15, if you have any queries or doubts or you need any help, you can always ask me personally in WhatsApp or Telegram or whatever. I will definitely help you with it in whatever way I can. Uh, but there will be a small gap between, you know, uh, only after that I will be back with videos, new videos. Okay, so anyway, thanks for staying back today. Different kingdoms emerged after Mauryan decline. Did they try any kind of territorial expansion in southern India? The kingdoms that came after Mauryan period were all petty kingdoms. Okay, in, in North India, Kushanas all expanded. I already told you that. But in South India, uh, you know, so you have the Shatavahanas, obviously. Then you have, you know, Cholas, Cheras, Pandyas. They were all petty kingdoms, not as large as Mauryans or anything. So they constantly come, you know, war with each other. All that eventually happened was all of them deteriorated because of these constant wars. Earlier, Cholas were very prominent, but Cheras and Pandyas beated them down and out. Uh, uh, with the decline of Cholas, Cheras and Pandyas became very prominent. And when Pallavas emerged, Pallavas completely vanquished the Cholas. So Cholas state was basically extinct by that time. But then Cholas came again towards the later part of or early part of medieval India. So all these are minor, minor kingdoms. They all constantly warred with each other, but nobody was able to expand in a considerable fashion as in North Indian kingdoms. Many reasons are there. Geographical reasons are also there. South India is completely filled with rivers. Okay, completely filled with rivers. It is not easy to cross these rivers. Even Harshavardhana, the very famous North Indian king, the, of the, the last major dynasty in North India, the Vardhanas, even he couldn't defeat the Chalukyan king Pulikesh II by crossing Na Narmada. Narmada was a major inhibition to his plans. Okay, so the South Indian geography, the hills, you know, Western Ghats, the rivers, etc. were a major inhibition in expansion of the South Indian kingdoms, unlike the North, where North is a comparatively a plain, the Indo-Gangetic plain, similarly the Indus plain, all these are very plain areas, very good for battle. That is why most of the battles are fought in Kannauj or Panipat or whatever. Okay, so let's stop it here. Thank you all for joining. Meet you again tomorrow at 5 p.m. Until then, bye-bye.